All right, guys, I want to take a little look at MindTap real briefly, just something that I noticed. So as a reminder, you're going to need to sign up for it. If you bought the physical text, you also need to purchase the MindTap access unless they came bundled somehow. You don't need to buy the physical text because you can read the book online. So if you went to content, you'd see MindTap over there. And then if you click on the link, it should open mind tap in its own window if it keeps it in this little d2l preview it's a problem you can't do everything there in that little preview so it should say launch in a new window now i can't simulate it here because no matter how many times i log off it remembers who i am that's kind of an interesting contrast most uh most situations right so when you load it up or when you're signing in you'll notice that there's that uh like the option to use it as a preview for, uh, you know, until February 7th or whatever that time is. So you could do that. But when you do that, it pops up, or at least uh, one student showed me, it pops up in this mode. And you can't find the text and you can't find anything. So uh, to get around in it in this mode, you can switch from week, week, week view to unit view. And then you can get down to unit one and read the chapter and stuff like that. You know, read the chapter from there. And there's two views, there's two ways to look at all this stuff. Just to make it slightly confusing, we have what I'm looking at right now is known as the original dashboard and then there's the new dashboard. And I don't know which one you're going to default to when you access it. When I look at it with the new dashboard, it looks like this and it doesn't have those three little tabs that I showed you there. If you go and you look at it with the original dashboard, it does have the three little tabs there. The weekly view, I haven't posted any homework there, but we have the book, the textbook there, the PowerPoints there. So anyways, I may just stick with the new dashboard, just pick one and run with it. And it's new, it's got to be better, right? So when you go down and you look at a unit, You can read the textbook there. It'll open it up in this, uh, you know, the little window, and you can zoom in. Scroll left and right through the text. I mean, through the pages of the book. So that's a good thing. How do I get out of that? Under study, there's review or review. I guess that's correct pronunciation. <laughs> then you have these, you should have these slides that you can look at. When you're looking at the slides, you ought to be able to zoom in. There we go, zoom in. Last week when I looked at it, they didn't have the previous and the next buttons, which made it really annoying. Maybe it, they were there for everybody else, but not me. But now they are there, or you can go with the, uh, you know, with the next the left and right cursor keys seem to work as well, which I had to use because I didn't have the previous and the next button. Or if you like regular old PowerPoints, like to download those to your hard drive, those are available as well. Hmm, I haven't actually tried playing them and haven't be read to me. That sounds like it'd be annoying, but yeah, you know, might be useful if you need that. Or if you have screen reader software, you know, you probably don't need that option there, but at least it's there. So then there's Reinforce. Why not give it a little bit better name than Reinforce? But what this is, is this is flashcards. Let's see if I can zoom this in because that's looking pretty pretty odd there. There we go. Yeah. Shuffle your deck of flashcards. You want to add your own cards, you can do that. So uh, yeah. that is a study mechanism there that you can do. You just make sure that you know, you know, flip the card. Make sure that you know what the, the, the terms mean. That's really that's really what you do with that. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to look at the PowerPoint. I'm going to do it the old way. Go to Content, PowerPoints. I promised y'all a quiz over binary and stuff like that. that. I guess that'll happen Thursday. All right, so I'm going to grab the PowerPoint. I always say this every time, but... Uh, if you view a PowerPoint in the little D2L preview window, it's really annoying. 
and it's not doing too bad today. But it's far better to go ahead and download it, and view it with the Microsoft, uh, you know, application PowerPoint. So you can just scroll down to the bottom of the window. It's kind of funny when you're scrolling here, you scroll through the PowerPoint and you move your cursor and you scroll up and down through the window. So I click download and pop it open. Yes. Yes. I believe I am recording. Let me make doubly sure. Awesome. Yes, I am. In fact, it looks like I'm redlining the, the volume out, so I'll hurt yours. So let's uh chapter one, an overview of computers and programming. You know, I'm gonna hit the PowerPoint, I'm not gonna hit every point on it, and then when I get tired of it, I'm gonna skip to the next chapter. Kind of kidding about that. But that is your reading assignment. Go ahead and read chapter one. I'm not gonna pick a date for it. Just go ahead and read it. You're adults, you know that. When you get a book, you're supposed to start reading it. So in this chapter, we will learn about computer systems, simple program logic, the steps involved in the program development cycle, pseudocode statements and flowchart symbols. That's actually about as far as we're going to get today, so I'm not going to read off the rest of these bullet points. What is a computer system? The combination of all the components required to process and store data using a computer. All right, so nowadays they make you know computers on a chip. And your phone is a computer, and your watch is probably a computer, but whatever. What is hardware? The hardware is whatever you can pick up. The equipment associated with the computer. You know all these terms. What is software? Software is the stuff you can't pick up that tells a computer what to do. And you install your software from the app store, you download it, or you know, put in some kind of media, and, or your machine comes with the software pre installed or whatever. Software consists of programs. What are programs? Programs are a series of instructions written by the programmers. So I like that it's kind of a tautology there. What is a programmer? If somebody writes programs. What are programs? Are things written by programmers? <laughs> All right. So programs are what tell the computer what to do, the system what to do. Programming is the act of writing those software instructions. And we'll keep using that word for a while. Uh, for a while. But you know, you also hear the word code. You know, I'm going to write some code today. Code doesn't mean I'm going to write something that's you know impossible. Uh, you know, there are codes. You know, like you encode a message to send it. You know, and make sure that the Russians don't intercept it or whatever. That's not the kind of code that this is. Code is just a series of instructions that follow a grammar, and the grammar tells and the instructions tell the program what to do. So there's different kinds of software, application software. That's stuff that either does something use. I mean, it's either makes money for you or lets you be creative or gives you fun. You know, those are your uh, your word processing programs, your your Excel, your spreadsheet. It's you know your budget, your all your games. All those are known as applications. Then there are utility software. So if you're a nerd, you may get as much fun out of uh, utility software as you do uh, games. And I'm using nerd in a, in a sense, thing, positive sense. I like nerds. I am a nerd. You know, so if you like formatting your hard drive or you know going around and reconfiguring things, you like utility programs. But uh, if you spend a lot of time in the control panel app, you know, of your uh, of your phone or your tablet or whatever, you know, all of that stuff is utility software as well. System software is the operating system like Windows, Linux, or Unix. Don't know why they leave Mac off. Google, Android, and Apple iOS. So the, the operating system is what controls the hardware. It's the layer between you and the hardware, or your program and the hardware. So, you know, just because you have a disk drive and you hooked it up to a computer, the computer couldn't use it if it didn't have software that knew how to control it. And you also have to download drivers to it, right? You know, sometimes you have to figure out what kind of drivers do it. You know, the advantages and the disadvantages of the phones is that they're not quite that customizable for the most part. You don't install drivers for your phone pretty much. So anyways, and then the system software will also come with the utilities required to manage your, uh, manage your computer. Computer hardware and software accomplishes three major operations. Input, processing, and on the next page, output. And so input can take many, many forms. You know, you can have sensors in a car that register how, you know, the RPM of the car or how hot the, you know, the, what you do your engine's running, you know. So 
you know, temperature input, pressure input. For the most part, we talk about typing in stuff, right, or clicking. That's the kind of input that we're going to be doing. Enter three numbers, you know, enter those numbers. That's the input. Anything that you do on the keyboard or with a controller or with a mouse or by tapping or touching, or they have all sorts of strange input devices. They have, you know, biofeedback things where you just try to think about it, like in that old Clint Eastwood movie about flying the plane by thought. So data items. You can use a scanner, you know, they give yourself images, you can record things, sound. We're, we're going to be dealing with text pretty much. We're going to type stuff in. And if we need something else, we'll probably just select a file and let it, you know, work on that file. And then processing. Processing is when your program responds to input. You could write a program that did not take any input, but it wouldn't be interactive for the most part. Like screen savers, you know, back once upon a time, People love screensavers. So, you know, what is a screensaver? Something that loads up and it just sits there and does stuff while your computer is idle. And then as soon as you touch the screen or whatever, it goes away. So those are kind of the anti-input programs. As soon as you give them input, they stop running. For the most part, though, programs to do anything useful or, or be fun or anything like that are going to require input. And then the processing is responding to that. You enter your name and your age, and it performs some calculations based on that. Maybe an astrology program. You tell it where you're born and the date and the time, and you know, it tells you, oh, you're an Aries, or whatever. You know, it's responding to your input. It's performing calculations on it. That's the stuff that we write are the calculations. And part of the logic of our program, a lot of it, all of it is involved in figuring out how to process the input. Because you have to gather your input, you have to process it, do something useful with it, and then you provide output. Because if it sits there and it processes and it doesn't tell you anything, then that's kind of a weird program. And it's kind of a specialized form of program, like spyware or something. You don't get to see what it's doing. Um, we're always going to want to give some output for our program, I'm pretty sure. But that output can take place in different forms. It doesn't have to be stuff that's displayed on the screen. right? Output could be you know, written to a file, stored somewhere, stored out to the internet. New story that I heard about yesterday is that people with a particular app on their their fitness devices or whatever, and then they go jogging and it would track for their you know and so then people built a map you know showing all the jogging routes or whatever a heat map of that and then just happened to show you know nicely you know um, military bases and Somalia you know and Iraq and stuff like that and the outline of all the paths that people go. It's not such a good thing from a security standpoint. To be issuing all your, uh, you know, all your military personnel Fitbits for their, you know, exercise, and then letting them enable an app that uploads all their GPS data to a common repository. But you know, that's the kind of thing that is out there, writing stuff up to the, uh, you know, to the cloud so that another application could use it. I always have the urge to digress. Um, I wish I could remember the name of the software. Yeah, the Strava Fitness Map accidentally reveals the location of secret military bases. And so that's an interesting uh, application. It was kind of fun to zoom around in it. I don't know if I'm going to be able to pop it up. If I can't find it in 30 seconds, I'm going to stop. There we go. So you can see where everybody wears their fitness and pebbles and Apple Watches and stuff like that, if they have that app installed. Apparently, a lot of people install that app, or else they're collecting it from other places that I don't know about. I haven't researched it very carefully. You can zoom in and see people's favorite jogging paths in Oklahoma or whatever. You can see why that would not be a great thing for your, you know, your secret bases to show up, you know, brilliantly on a map like that. So yeah, it's fun to be able to see your own jogging path, load up an app and see that, but where that data is being stored and who else is using it for something else is a privacy concern that you may or may not be concerned about. Aggregate data, you know, data not just about you, you have your own security concerns. You don't want somebody to be able to find out, you know, how often you jog and your regular path to do that. Um, but on the other hand, you know, aggregate data, big data is what they call it, it's where you're processing, you know, millions upon millions of people's input in order to try to draw useful connections about it. Pretty much, this is just probably a 
a straight map of population density, you know, pretty much. If you assume that just about everybody, you know, above a certain income, you know, has a smart device that can track their, you know, track their jogging or whatever. And, or at least 10% of them do, the fitness minded or whatever, you know, so. I would assume that the brightness corresponds with just sheer population density. And it's kind of interesting to look. Certain states just are not very pop well populated, right? Or else everybody there, nobody uses a smart device. And that's unlikely. So the programming language used to write computer instructions called computer code. Writing instructions is called coding the program. Or you could call it writing the program. But anyways, coding the program. You have different programming languages. <coughs> Visual Basic, C Sharp, C++, Java. There's not like, you know, 7,000 different programming languages. Why are there so many? Well, because somebody invents one and then somebody else decides that it doesn't do quite what they want it to do. And so they write their own version. Yeah. And generally that's what happens. But you have some extraordinarily popular programming languages and then you have you know lots of them that you know that's very rarefied you know 10 or 20 or 100 people in academia use or whatever and then there are languages that are written to be deliberately obtuse just for the fun of programming in something that's hard to program and you know programmers have a weird sense of humor so some of them write languages that are impossible to use and some of them have obscene names I won't say and another one is a name called intercal you ever want to read something stupid it's a it's a an obtuse programming language from the 70s and by obtuse I mean it's deliberate well here you can see it intercal the language from heck it's kind of fun to read if you're a nerd so what do why do we write instructions what does it mean to code a program well I got up here and I drew chip in a box Right, and I listed the opcodes that he understood, like three opcodes, four opcodes, something like that. Well, ultimately, everything on a computer is a number, including those opcodes. You know, somehow you have to figure out that this number represents this opcode and this number represents this opcode. You know, you have to write those numbers to memory so that the program can run them. But you don't want to write in pure numbers. I don't even know if. Uh, I could find a good example, but let's do machine language example. Example of machine language. <laughs> Somebody here has made up a machine language for controlling a light bulb. You can turn the bulb on, you can turn it off, you can dim it by 10%, you can brighten it by 10%. If it's fully on, you skip the next instruction. If it's fully off, you skip the next instruction. You can run the program again, or you can stop the program. So, you know, it has like eight different opcodes or whatever. So, you don't really want to write something just in pure numbers, unless, you know, unless your brain just really works in, in that interesting fashion. That's what people had to do in the 40s when they, you know, computers were first being invented. The first electronic computers were being invented. There were no programming languages. You just had to see it. Um, and as a matter of fact, programs would be entered, you know, perhaps as a series of dials. Yeah. You might have, you know, a hundred dials on your on your bank, you know, your wall length computer. And each num dial represented a series of numbers that it was supposed to do. You know, and you press a button and it would go ahead and you know and process those dials. And that's an extraordinarily clumsy way of doing it, right? So you'd rather have a way of giving that program in a better format than that. And that's where the idea of, you know, paper tape or punch cards or magnetic tape, you know, whatever, so that you can rerun that program just by giving it a new set of punch cards or mounting a new tape. But you have those numbers. You don't want to write something that's just a series of numbers, you know. Machine language just consists, language, let's uh, try to rewrite that, you know, series of numbers representing opcodes that control, you know, computer hardware. Nobody wants to write a machine language, so, you know, 
as soon as computers were around, you know, within six years of the computers were um, being around, people started writing computer languages that were a step up from machine language, where you could use words and abbreviations in order to control it. And so the lowest level language that is a step up from writing numbers, I cannot type that word language, above machine language, <laughs> third time, is assembly. You may have heard that. I'm an assembly programmer. Yeah. Probably not very many people say that. You know, they're kind of a mystical awe. Those are the people who can write programs that look like this. Pop open some example. Here we go. Ignore this side. This is the assembly part of it. These are the comments that tell what this stuff is doing. This stuff looks incomprehensible to us as well because it's just like three letter abbreviations and stuff like that. These things are known as labels. You get to make those labels up if you're an assembly programmer. But then the rest of it, you know, are these three letter abbreviations that pretty much correspond directly to the opcode. So instead of opcode one meaning read, you actually get to work, use the word read or move or something like that. And jump and move. Set B, and I have no idea what I almost did. I learned assembly, you know, when I had to in college in the 80s, and then I never used it again. People still do use it because it is the most efficient use of resources. If you were going to write something that had to run in a very, very limited amount of space and run very, very quickly, you were doing this kind of stuff. And the video games in the 80s were written in assembly because they didn't have, you know, not great big computers with gigabytes of RAM or whatever. They had to run like in 256, you know, bytes of RAM or two kilobytes of RAM or whatever. So you can be sure that all your old Nintendo games and your Atari games and the stand-up games, you know, in the 80s were written in assembly. Almost going on a tangent, going to resist the urge. So you have these things and then, so this is just a text file. And then that text file has to be turned in to machine language. And so there's a program called the assembler, which runs through and it turns this stuff into those numbers and writes them out to a file. And then that file can be executed as a program. And we're not going to do that. But we see that this is a step up from just writing zeros and ones and, you know, or whatever, writing a series of numbers. And so you can do sophisticated programming logic with assembly. It's just that it's not a good tool for writing huge programs. You can be sure that Call of Duty or Dragon Age or you know Word or Chrome or all these big applications that we use um, are not written in assembly because those are just absolutely huge programs being written by teams of dozens of people or hundreds of people. And so they need to in order to work on a project like that, you want something that's more understandable than this. You don't want some rarefied thing that only 0.001% of the population is capable of understanding. And you want the logic to be clearer than that. You want the way the program works to be clear so that if you need to go and add something new to it, you can find what you need to change and change it. Or so if you want to add stuff, it's you know not difficult to add to it, relatively not difficult. So assembly is, you know, mnemonics, I'm not quite, abbreviations, whatever, keywords that correspond to the opcodes. Okay. So one thing about machine language is it's very, very, very hardware specific. You, know, you probably know that your, all your computers use, you know, either AMD or Intel processors in them, which, you know, pretty much have a, are rather, they, they have a fair, very similar op code sets, but then all, almost all your phones are written using another platform, you know, called ARM, A-R-M, and Intel sure would like for you to, you know, 
to be able to use their chips in the phones and stuff like that. So they keep trying to work deals in, you know, with the phone manufacturers. But right now, the ARM processors are the, are the most efficient ones for the phones to use, by and large. If you wrote an assembler program, it's specific to one specific hardware platform. This is a program that will run on a Pentium chip. Or this is a program that will run on the 64-bit Pentium architecture, you know. You know, there might be broader or, you know, or more narrow specifications or whatever. And this is one that will run, you know, on an ARM processor. So that's kind of a problem because if you're writing software, you don't want it to be limited to just one very specific platform. You know, if you can write something that will run on a, you know, on Windows or Mac or Linux or your Chromebook, you know, Really cool if you can do that, and you're not going to do it writing zeros and ones or using those three letter codes. So, you want a high level language in order to do that. So, our low level languages, we're typically going to say a low level language is assembly. And then we have high level languages Python, C, and the entire C family of languages, which includes C, C sharp and Java, JavaScript, yeah. All of these share syntax that was based on the C programming language invented in 1970, which was an improvement of the language. Maybe it was called B, I forget. Yeah, you know, invented in the 60s or whatever. So the earliest high-level languages, especially the ones that are still commonly in use, you may have heard of, COBOL programmers, and you make fun, you know, the COBOL programmers all being 78 or 80 years old, but there's still huge amounts of COBOL code out there, especially used in government. And so, yeah, the aging COBOL programmers who were trained in the 60s and the 70s, uh, you know, they may still be working part-time um, maintaining that software and adding new features to it, but it's also a big deal trying to port those programs to a, uh, you know, to a more modern language. And then Fortran. And Fortran is still very widely used, although it also has a reputation for being a very old programming language, also invented in the 50s. So I'm going to list other ones. COBOL, Fortran, and, you know, there's uh, billions of others. Okay, that's an exaggeration. Hundreds upon hundreds of other. So a high-level language. I wonder if I can find an example of a assembly that I could, well, I guess I'll just copy that and I'll load up WordPad and write my notes in WordPad rather than Word. I mean, well, maybe not. I'm not digging how that looks. Okay. Just grabbing one totally at random. Don't even care which one it is. So assembly. So assembly is abbreviations, keywords that correspond to the opcodes. You use an assembler to convert that code. To a program, machine language. High-level programs, Python, C, C++, they're much more understandable than this kind of stuff. Let's find a uh, Java program example for I don't know, displaying prime numbers. There we go. Much more comprehensible. Yeah, we don't know, unless you're already a programmer, you know what words like class mean. And there's a whole bunch of words here that we don't really know what they mean. But we can see that it looks very much like English. We have words like for and string, public and static, 
and you know, and we have algebraic notation, equal signs and minus signs and plus signs, and you know, the, the way that we're used to expressing math, rather than having to see add instructions, ADD and moves and stuff like that. All this stuff, you know, certainly can do math, but it doesn't look like algebraic notation. So that's what a high level language is. High level language has a English like syntax, you know, uses English words and yeah, you could write a high level language in another program other than English, but you know, a natural language that, that you know, human speak and algebraic notation. So that's how the logic of that is expressed. With a specific syntax, every computer programming language has a syntax. It has its own syntax, although it may be similar to other ones. And the Python one that we will use is similar to a lot of other ones, but it has you know its own uniquenesses as well, or else it wouldn't be Python. It would be another programming language. So that's the attribute of a high-level syntax, I mean, of a high-level language. It's got English-like syntax and algebraic notation. And I think I've made this comment before, but it probably has to be really strange to grow up speaking Mandarin or something like that, and then you become a programmer and you have to learn all these English words in order to use it, in order to write the code. So I'm sure that there are some other language-specific human language, not computer language, programming languages. I know that Perl was invented by a Japanese programmer, but I don't know whether he coded it so that it accepts Japanese as its programming language or if you're still using words like if and then and for and equals and stuff like that in it. So you have this English-like syntax and algebraic notation, but you have the same problem. It has to be converted to that machine language, just like this had to be converted to machine language, right? This had to be converted to, to numbers. So does this stuff. And there's two ways that that happens. You can use what's known as a compiler, which takes your source code, your programming code, and turns it into machine language. Or you can use something called an interpreter. <laughs> Interpreter, which takes that source code and converts it to machine language. Yeah, is that the same thing? Um, ultimately, it is. But a compiler generates an executable file, an app that you can put it on an app store, you can put it on the internet, or you can give it to somebody on a CD or whatever. It is the machine language you distribute to your customers. The machine language program. An interpreter, it still looks like I'm going to spell that wrong, doesn't turn it into machine language until you actually run it. So what you give a customer is actually the source code for the program. And the most common form of an interpreted language is JavaScript. You're not going to learn JavaScript. You want to learn JavaScript, take my scripting course. We will, we will hit upon that. But JavaScript is used to control web pages. Let's go to some website that's not extraordinarily complex. I can't think of any. I'm going to hit Facebook. I'm going to right click and do View Page Source. And we see all of this stuff up here inside what's known as a script tag. And this is a programming language. You know, the first web pages didn't have programming languages incorporated in them. Because those first web pages were very simple. You know, they were just text on a page with some pictures and stuff like that. They weren't really complex, interactive things like, you know, Facebook and Amazon and, you know, or whatever. So this gets downloaded to your program every time you access Facebook. It downloads this text, and then the browser turns it into machine language on the, on the fly to control, you know, what you see on your browser, browsing screen. So this is a scripting language known as JavaScript. We're using another scripting language known as Python. A scripting language, the definition of it is one that requires an interpreter in order to run. 
the good news about something that requires an interpreter in order to run is that it can run on multiple operating systems. Now, some of y'all may be gamers who've used emulators. I want to play my Sega Genesis games, and I want to be able to play them on my Android phone. So I'm going to install some emulation software so that you can give it, you know, the code that's taken from the chips of a Sega cartridge, and you can run it on your, on your PC and play your games that way. Or you can run it on, you know, whatever will hold that emulator. And so when people write an emulator, a common one is known as MAME, MAME, multi some arcade machine emulator, something like that. And so you can play Pac-Man and Donkey Kong and all those games, you know, and on your Windows PC. But since that emulator has also been written on Mac and Linux, you can take that same cartridge data and play it on your Mac and on your Linux computers or on your phones or, you know, anything that supports that emulator can run those games. And so now people buy those little Raspberry Pi computers, you know, they're the size of a deck of cards or whatever, and you can install emulation software on it and you can play pretty much any video game, you know, that was ever written in the 80s and the 90s and maybe even up from that just on the little box, you know, that you hook up to your TV or monitor or something like that. And that works via emulation software where the interpreter and then Python interpreter is one, an example of this. this is like an emulator. It emulates the way the computer works. It takes that language and then it turns it on the fly as soon as you run it into the machine language. And so you write a Python interpreter for your PC and then you write one for your Mac and you write one for Linux and then, you know, and your Raspberry Pi and, and this, that, and the other. And so the same code works on a whole bunch of different platforms. Platforms meaning different systems. And that's an advantage. That's a good thing. It's better to write something that more people can run, right? And if you're a business, you don't want uh, you know software being written that will only run you know on a certain subset of your computers. If you can write something that will run on all your computers, that's great. But that's one people. That's one reason why people write web applications, is because if you can get it to run on a web page, then uh, you know all of your companies that, that your business can can access it. But there are limits to what a web page can do. So that's what an interpreter is. That's what a compiler is. A compiler creates a machine language file, which we will call an application, an executable. You've heard that term, like the .exe files on Windows, and those are given to a user or sold or whatever to run on their computer. Whereas an interpreter takes original code, they actually get the text of the code of the program. The user gets the text of the program and the interpreter turns it into machine language when it needs to be run. Earn, run. So the syntax of the rules governing the word usage and the punctuation. An example of that is if you're going to express a calculation, if you want to perform a mathematical calculation. Example. X is equal to 1 plus 2. That is a syntax. The syntax is, is that there has to be a variable on this side, there has to be an equal sign, and then there has to be a mathematical expression. You can't type this in programming languages you're likely to use here and have it work. These would mean completely different things. These computer languages, the vast majority of them, process just like the um, algebraic notation that you learned, you know, in high school or junior high or whatever, where you have a letter and you have an expression, and the expression would be evaluated and stored in that. So this is correct, and this is wrong syntax. And you will just learn that, that your variable always goes on one side of the equal sign, and then the mathematical expression goes on the other. So x is equal to 1 plus 2 is correct x is equal to 1, 2 plus, 
That's not correct in this language, in most of the programming languages you're going to learn. That would be something called reverse Polish notation, and HP calculators used to support that, where you would enter your numbers and then you would type the sign. Yeah. And it's a valid syntax, it's just not a valid syntax for the programming languages we tend to use. The C family of programming languages, Python, you know. So this is right and this is wrong. You just have to know. Some languages require semicolons after, you know, the end of each expression like that. So this is correct for a C style language. Python doesn't doesn't like those semicolons. They, they don't break it for the most part, but they don't require it. If you typed in this statement and you left the semicolon off in C, C, Java, it wouldn't work. You would get a syntax error when you try to compile it. Incorrect for a C style language. Because many languages, those languages require semicolons at the end of the expressions. And you'll see examples of that in the textbook if you go through. I'm sure that there's lots of Java code and C code and stuff like that. We leave the semicolons off in our programming language. So that's incorrect for a C style language, but good for Python. Because those languages require semicolons. So that's just an example of syntax. Syntax is how you have to arrange it in order for it to be cleanly converted into machine code. I will use the term parse sometimes. Parsing means analyzing a sentence and taking it apart, just like you did flowcharts. Not flowcharts. When you had to diagram a sentence, I don't even know if they make poor suffering students diagram sentences anymore, but you remember that. You know, you had the line here and you had your, you know, your object and your subject and your verb and then the diagonal lines underneath it or whatever. That's because the English language does have a syntax, however it has an incredibly loose one and you can abuse it dramatically and <laughs> people will still understand it. That's because our brain is a far better parser than any computer program. That's why people earn a lot of money figuring out how to convert, you know, the English that people type in and pull information out of it. So mistakes in the languages uses are known as syntax error. The interpreter or the compiler cannot parse that sentence, that expression, and figure out what it was supposed to do. So it throws up its hands. It stops running at that point or it doesn't run to begin with. One of those two things. Alrighty. Veering away from languages, a computer has memory in it. Just like Chip when he had that scrolling sheet of paper. Random access memory just means that memory can be accessed in any order. You want address 1000 and then you want address you know, 7000, you want address 1 billion, you know. The chip is just as fast at getting any of those. If it wasn't random, you know, what if you had to go to it in order? That would be, you know, like stuff invented during the 40s and the 50s, and you know, you're pulling in data from punch cards that have to be entered in order, or you know, it's got a tape drive and it's got to, you know, read all the data in order to get to that one. And so, you know, random access is far better than having to access it sequentially in order to find it. RAM is typically volatile memory, meaning that it's lost, the contents are lost when the power is off. And then there is non-volatile memory. Your, your phones have some kind of flash RAM in it or something like that, that maintains its state even when the power is interrupted. So that if your phone runs out of juice, you, know, you don't have to reinstall the phone's operating system in order to start using it again. Or if you type add in a contact, you know, it's not lost as soon as the phone is start, turned off. So permanent storage devices, you know, non-volatile memory used to involve spinning platters, your hard drives, or your, you know, your 
CD-ROMs or DVDs or whatever. Nowadays, you know, a lot of devices use non-spinning platters. You know, you can involve, get solid-state hard drives to put in your laptop so that you don't have a hard drive in it. You know, a spinning hard drive and it's much faster to load, you know, quieter, uses less memory or whatever. And it'd be silly if you could hear a little teeny tiny hard drive inside your phone, you know, as you used it. But the iPods, no, 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 you know, first five, six, seven models of the iPods had little teeny tiny hard drives in them. So a compiler and interpreter, we mentioned that. It translates source code into machine language. And it calls it object code, but whatever. We have our machine language, and then for it to be run, it first has to be stored in non-volatile memory, pretty much. You have to have it on your hard drive or on your phone. And then it gets loaded into the RAM in order to execute. So the compiler checks for the syntax errors because otherwise, you know, if it doesn't mean anything, like you could have, you know, like I said, the English language has a syntax, and if you mess it up, we still understand it. So, for example, in the English language, adjectives precede nouns. So you say the red tractor. In French, the adjectives typically follow the noun. And I don't know the word for tractor. And then I don't know the word for red in French, rouge, you know, something like that. But anyways, so people who have learned the French syntax, even if they happen to know the translations for the words, might say tractor red rather than red tractor. That works because we know uh, our brains are flexible and they can figure out what they meant. But same is not true of programming languages where the syntax needs to be very precise in order to be converted into machine code. So that's just an example, and I'm going to delete that. So the program executes or runs. It is loaded. That's what loading means. Stored into random access memory. So Chip was following his instructions. The instructions were in the same memory that his data was, which is kind of weird. The input will be accepted. Some processing will occur, and results will be output. Be written back to the memories so that it can be displayed on screen or saved out to, you know, to a hard drive, permanent storage, or whatever. So programs with syntax errors cannot execute. And I know that last week I said that if you give me a program that does not execute because of a syntax error, you're likely to receive the equivalent of a 0% on it. I give you one point just to mark that, you know, it was looked at. Because if you got a zero, how would you know whether I even looked at it or not, right? But then you just revise it, and you re-upload it, and you're going to get more credit. Logical errors. The error runs, but it produces incorrect output. You know, you wanted it to print the first 100, you know, prime numbers. But instead, it prints all the first, you know, the numbers 1 through 100. Well, there's a couple prime numbers in there, but a lot of them are not prime numbers. There's no syntax errors in it, but it gave you the wrong answer. Or you're writing, a, you know a self-driving car, and when it detects that there's a person in front of it, it slams on the accelerator. That's a logic error. A variable is a named memory location whose value can vary because you're manipulating these pieces of data, but you have to give these pieces of data names. The invention of the variable was a big leap in programming because, you know, when we were making chip do things, we were saying, okay, load memory address 8. Load memory address 32. Load memory address 74. It's better to be able to give it a name. Load the person's age. You know, store the person's age here. You know, load the temperature in Celsius and put it here. You don't want to have to specify numbers like you're, you know, trying to write a program that would just, you know, stick pieces of paper in, paper in a mailbox and then later on, you know, pull them out based on the number. You'd want to know the person's name if you were delivering mail. So we're going to expand this definition just a little bit. A variable is not just a named memory location whose value can vary. We're going to give it a little bit of a more 
detailed explanation. A variable is a named location in memory that has a type and contains a value. What does that type mean? The type is what kind of data is stored there. So for example, you could have a variable name and you could set it equal to, you know, Joe Bob. The name, um, tell you what, I'm just going to make it this. First name is the name of the variable. Joe is the value, the assigned value for the variable. And then it also has a type. And you're going to learn what the different types mean. Broadly speaking, at the beginning, the types of data we're going to be manipulating are strings, which is this stuff that can be typed in from the keyboard that has, you know, letters and numbers and symbols in it. So string is a sequence of numbers, letters, and punctuation, or symbols. So Joe is a string, or first name is a string. So the type of the variable is a string. Were you expected to know that before you came in here? No, but now you do. A string is a sequence of stuff. You can have an empty string. You know, if it says press any key to continue and you just hit enter rather than type something, it generates an empty string, right? There's no data at all. Other types of data. You could have numeric data, which is broadly speaking divvied up into two types. Integer, which is whole numbers, and then floating point. which is numbers with a decimal point, right? Are those called real numbers? I forget, you know. Numbers that include decimal points. Now, that may seem nebulous if you have a whole number 3, and then you have the floating point number 3.0. Are they equal to each other? Well, yeah, mathematically, we could say that 3 is equal to 3.0, but inside the computer, believe it or not, they are stored in completely different formats. And the reason they're stored in completely different formats is that math is done on integers in a completely different way than math is done on floating point numbers. And integer math is very, very fast to the computer. Computers were you know, designed to do integer math very quickly. And it used to be that you would install a floating point card, a floating point coprocessor into your 1980s computer in order to speed it up. You know, the first chips did not do floating point math very quickly, and so you could buy a 386 chip, and then you could buy a 387 math coprocessor, which would do the floating point math, which would be important if you were going to run games, you know, that involved, you know, like rendering pictures and stuff like that, making three-dimensional environments for your character to run through. So video cards are capable of doing insane amounts of math very, very quickly. You know, they're very, very optimized for doing floating point math as well as, you know, integer math. Effectively, your video card is your math coprocessor anymore. Video cards are actually more powerful, the expensive ones, than the processor itself that you buy and you put in your chip at doing math. So maybe you've heard of Bitcoin mining. You know, Bitcoin mining, a Bitcoin is just a series of numbers that has to meet a very specific, you know, set of requirements. And it's... A weird kind of money because you can make your own money. You mine, you set a computer running to try to calculate that number, and if your computer is the first one to calculate that number that meets all the requirements and nobody else has gotten that number, then you have discovered that Bitcoin. You have mined it. But it is a very complex mathematical sequence to try to process to get a number that meets the criteria for it. And so people write programs that run on video cards because the video card is faster and better at doing math than, their, uh, than the chip on the computer itself. And you can install seven or eight, you know, video cards in a computer that has a lot of slots on it and you could mine for a whole bunch of Bitcoins very rapidly. And so people, you know, you, know, the, the, you may have heard the Bitcoins reached a value of like 10000 or $20,000 per coin or whatever. Uh, so it became very profitable 
to mine for that. So people would build, you know, roomfuls of computers running mining software, which is doing all the math trying to find, you know, bitcoins. So anyway, your floating point numbers are the ones that include decimal points. So if we were going to talk about different kinds of data, if you have this, Joe, that's a string. So is anything else that we include in quotes. In your programming code, if you say that, it looks like a number, but it's really a string. If you do that, that's a string. Anything between quotes is considered a string. And you use the quotes because otherwise the computer might not recognize the syntax. If you did this, name is equal to Joe Bob, that would not meet any computer syntax. It doesn't know that mysteriously you started meaning that that was somebody's name as instead of part of the programming code. So the, print, the uh, quote sign marks this as data rather than instructions for the computer. So strings are enclosed in quotes. And in this particular language, you can use the double quotes and you can use the apostrophes interchangeably. So Joe is also a string, just like Joe is. They mean the same exact thing. If you have the number 13, that's an integer, which we're going to abbreviate int. If you have the number 13.0, that's a float, which stands for floating point value. I think I have those backwards right. Um, I mean, not backwards, but the type and then the meaning of it. You can figure out these types by eyeballing them, but you can also get the language to tell you the type of the data. If you launch idle, if you go to the search box, type in idle, or however you're going to launch it, and you get to the shell, not doing a file new, but, but just leaving it in the shell here, if you type in a is equal to 13 and then you say type a it returns the type of that variable it says okay that was an integer you don't even have to store it in a variable first to figure out its type you could say what is the type of 13 oh 13 is an integer what is the type of 13.1 well that's a float what is the type of 13.0? Now, do our brains, 13 and 13.0, mean the same way, but they're processed differently? The way that integers and floats are treated do not differ much in Python nearly this, to nearly the same degree as in some other programming languages. In C, C++, Java, and stuff like that, integers and floats are treated very, very differently. They have very serious consequences if you do integer division as opposed to floating point division. You get entirely different answers. Sounds weird, but if an integer can only hold a whole number, right, then if you divide 3 by 2, what is 3 divided by 2? It's 1.5, right? But if you were doing integer math, you can't have 1.5 because that's not a whole number, so it will get rounded down. Now, Python handles that for you. If you say 3 divided by 2, it does tell you that it's 1.5, even if you had, even if the, uh, the input to it was two integers rather than floating point numbers. So there we go. Those are our three main data types. We will find, and we will even create our own data types as we go along further. But that's enough for now. We're going to pause. So the program development cycle. Why is it called a cycle? Because it's represented like this. Yeah, this is a list, but in real life, it works as a cycle of stuff. Yeah, just like real life, you know. Your groceries are done in a cycle. You think of things that you want to buy. You go to the store and you buy them. Later on, you cook the food. You eat the food. You don't add any more groceries, so you make a grocery list and you go back to the store. And sometimes these go in tight little loops. You know, you're trying to make your kale salad and you don't have any kale, you got to go back and get the kale. Or you find out that you don't have any eggs, you got to go to the store and get the eggs or whatever. You know, so things are cyclical. Understanding the problem. 
You know, somebody says, okay, I want you to write, you know, a Pac-Man game. And it looks just like Pac-Man, but it has different shaped characters, so for legal reasons, it'll be okay. So anyways, got to understand the problem. You know, I don't know what Pac-Man is. No. And you look at a picture and you go, okay, there's a guy who's running around, and then there's dots, and then there's funny little ghosts, and I could write a game where a guy can move around and eat. Yeah. And then there's more to it than that, right? Because I don't even know how many people have ever played Pac-Man anymore. But, uh, you know, you eat a power dot, the ghosts change colors, and you can chase them and eat them. That's part of the problem, understanding the problem. More specifically than that, on one level, you get a lot of time when the ghosts remain, you know, in an edible state. And then as you progress through the game, you know, that amount of time that you get in order to eat the ghosts diminishes to make it more difficult until you finally get to a point where eating a power dot does not, not do a darn thing. You know, the ghosts don't, you know, stay blue to be edible for any length of time at all. So that's, those are the hardest levels. You have to have all that information in order to understand the problem. Then you find out that, oh, there were supposed to be these fruits that would appear in the game and you would get bonus points for eating the fruit. And then you had to know that, oh, but those fruit disappear after a certain amount of time. And what's the point of those things? Um, you know, in video game design, especially this kind, you try to give, you know, something that's enticing that'll drive your character to try to get it. But then that makes you more vulnerable to attack from, you know, the other things that are on the screen. So you give them a prize, but you make it more difficult, you know, for the prize. Yeah. You make it more difficult for the character if they elect to go and get that prize. The advantage to the prize is points. Ooh, points are important. Yeah. People used to care a lot about points. Now you have games, you know, without points. You know, you have games where you're acting out a story rather than accumulating points. So anyways, you have to understand the problem. You have to have requirements. You may just be making it up entirely on your own. You know, there are game studios which consist of which like one or two people. You know, indie game studios. You know, Super Meat Boy. Um, uh, what's the another really huge one. World of Goo, an incredibly popular indie game, you know, just written by two people as opposed to a team of 50 or 100 like you would find at Electronic Arts. You've got to understand the problem. Listing the requirements for a problem is an art and a science of its own. If you work in a business, you've got to get all the requirements for the program. You know, your, your team needs an accounting program, you better understand accounting. You, know, and you have to understand what kind of screens that your users are going to be using. So you get a list of requirements. Now, for my assignments, by and large, I'm going to give you your requirements. But they're going to be pretty loosey-goosey. Write a program that accepts somebody's age and, and somebody's address and then prints it out in the format of a mail mailing address, whatever. I don't tell you exactly how it has to look. I might give you a screenshot of how the program might look if you wrote it the way that I would. But even then, unless I say it has to look exactly like this, and I almost never do, you have the freedom to design the way that you want it to look yourself because it would be really boring. But, you know, at a business place, you might be given a list of requirements and have to write exactly to that spec because the programmers are different than the designers. Same goes for, you know, game development or whatever, you know, people come up with the way that the game is supposed to work and the programmers go and they actually make it happen, but you're supposed to make it happen exactly the way that the, uh, that the designers wanted it to work. So you have to understand the problem. You have to plan the logic. Okay, how am I going to get the data, the address, and the name? What is my logic going to be? Is it going to be stored on a hard drive? Is the user going to type it in right then and there? Or how do I get that data? If they're going to type it in right then and there, what form, you know, what order do I ask for these things? You know, do I give them the chance of editing that information before they send it to the printer to print out their mailing address? You plan the logic of all that, and you plan your logic based on understanding the problems. Then you write the code. Okay, I understand now. I'm going to get the person's name and their address, and then I'm just going to immediately turn around and send it to the printer. So, you write the code that does that based on the logic. You plan your logic using flowcharts and pseudocode, which we will talk about. And as you become a skilled programmer, you can usually do the planning and the coding in your head as you go along. It's useful sometimes to have detailed plans of the logic. If you're writing a complex, problem, 
You can be sure that the people who are writing Bitcoin miners are following very detailed logic plans that have been mapped out, and they have the flowcharts and the pseudocodes and the algorithms all laid out before they start writing the code. You translate the code. Well, we don't translate the code. The compiler translates the code. Kind of erase that. It's not something we do. Test the program. You run it. You see if it works. If there are any mistakes in it, you go back and you rewrite it. Oh, I misspelled it. I put. I didn't put semicolons. And you keep repeating this cycle until the program runs. Once it runs, you try to determine if it runs correctly. Fix the syntax errors first, and then you fix the logic errors. Did it actually print my mailing address? No. Did, it, did it leave off the zip code? Well, that's bad logic. I forgot to print out the zip code. Typically, programmers, when they test their program, they're trying to get it to work. But you also have to test your program to see if you can break it. Because the users are going to find ways to break it. So you need to find them first. It's really unprofessional to ship programs that'll crash if they're given bad input. You don't like it when your programs crash. You know, Windows has encountered an error and your application has been terminated. You know, oh no, my term paper is gone. You know, bad stuff. Or your game crashes. You know, it's very frustrating. You know, people don't like crashes. You have to try to code your program in such a way that it doesn't crash. Once it works, you put the program into production. Publish it to the App Store. Put it on the Internet so that people can download it. You know, whatever. Deliver it to them on a on a floppy drive, whatever. So then maintaining the program. And all of this, you know, is kind of cyclical. Once you put the program into production, your users are going to be testing the program every day when they use it. They're not going to be trying to break it, but they're going to use your program. And they're going to find things that are wrong with it. Just like, you know, modern games are shipped pretty much before they're done. And then the end users wind up doing the so-called beta testing, and then they have to fix them, you know, they post the updates and you have to download the updates or whatever. So maintaining the program is correcting mistakes in it and adding features to it. This is a job unto itself. If you get hired onto a programming shop, there are several different roles you can take. There are testers. You may have heard of play testers, you know, the people who play the game and try to find bugs in it, but there are also other kinds of testers. There are people who look at source code trying to find mistakes or to see if you match the specifications. That's a part of the responsibilities of the testing department or the QA department, the quality assurance department. Anyways, anybody who finds something wrong, the program has to be fixed or new features have to be added. That's called program maintenance. And that continues until the program is put to pasture. Yeah, yeah I'm not, I'm not going to make any changes to this program ever, you know, any point in the future. At that point, you don't need program maintenance. People ask for new features. Okay, you know I want the ability to use lightsabers in my in my uh, you know in my medieval game. Okay, understand the problem. How, what does using the lightsabers mean? You know how do they differ from an ordinary sword? Uh, you know do I have to have some kind of energy source for them? You never see Luke Skywalker run out of a battery, at, at, you know, in the middle of a battle. So I guess these things have infinite in energy. So. Understanding the problem is one of the most difficult aspects of programming, and I guess we're just about running to the end of our time. You have to know who the end users are, the people for whom the program is written. If you're writing a Dora the Explorer game, it probably has to be at a simpler level, you know, than uh, World of Warcraft. And, you know, the accounting department, you know, they speak their own accounting language. They won't be speaking your language. They won't be talking about bits and bytes and access and opcodes and stuff like that. You know, so you could write a program that's designed for programmers, you know, and that's going to look quite a bit different than if you were going to write a program for another category of people to use, which is why Notepad looks very different than a full-fledged programming environment. And why don't we stop here? Are there any questions? I know I did a lot of babbling. Thank you. I haven't seen anybody slump over. If you did, you managed to hide behind your monitor. So good job on staying awake. No homework yet except for reading. We'll be putting homework into place because I will ex have expected you to read. Yeah. So do read the text. You can look at the PowerPoint for the shortcut reading, but you know reading the text is good as well. You're responsible for reading the text. If I give a quiz, it may draw from the text and not include stuff that uh, is in the in the lecture. 
On the other hand, the vast, vast, vast majority of quizzes I give you are take-home quizzes where you have time to look up the answers you know, if you need to. So, I'm talked out. Are y'all listened out? We're done.